Hi, this is Scotty Barnhart, director of the Count Basie Orchestra, and you're listening to Talking Blues. First of all, let me ask you, this is September 1st. How was the hurricane, the recent hurricane that went through Florida? Were you affected by that at all? No, not at all. You know, it, we got, we, luckily this time, we were right on the edge of it. So we got just a little bit of rain. My power blinked off once, but it never stayed off. So I actually got lucky this time, and it just went by. Still got a little rain today, but um, before, the last one, kind of, we got kind of a lot of it. But there are some people here in town that don't have power, and a few limbs down here and there, and the governor's mansion is only a few miles from me, and they had a big, huge oak tree that fell on top of the governor's mansion, but they were okay. But other than that, Tallahassee, actually, we were lucky this time. Are you are living in Florida? Is this something you just get used to? Yeah, you get used to it. I mean, I lived in L.A. for 20 years, and you kind of get used to earthquakes and stuff, but you hear about this time every year, usually there's one or two that get close or kind of make its way, makes its way, you know, near here, because New Orleans is just five hours to the to the west, and we're kind of in the panhandle, so it's, you know, Hurricane Katrina got New Orleans, and but we've had a few that have come straight through here, and uh, but we're about 20, 30 miles inland, so it doesn't get us too bad, but it can, it can be pretty bad sometimes, but this time, it wasn't bad, we were, we were stocked up with stuff, and, you know, batteries, and food, and stuff like that, and luckily, nothing happened, we just slept right through it, just a small amount of rain. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to begin talking about how you got into music. Mm -hmm. Tell me how music first came into your life. Okay, well, the way that I got into music, my mother and my grandmother were musicians. So basically with my mom, you know, from the time I was conceived, I guess, you know, she was a pianist and organist and singing in the choir at church every Sunday, playing piano all the time. So, you know, when I was born, man, growing up, we always had music in the house. Always had, I remember always something always was on a stereo system or whatever. But most importantly, we were at church every Sunday. And uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, our family has been at Ebenezer Baptist Church with the King families for about 115 years. That's how long we've been in that church. And uh, so my mother was in one of the choirs, and Daddy King, Dr. King Sr., had four choirs there. And each Sunday was a different choir. My mom was in the church choir. They did Handel and Bach and chorales and stuff like that. And then there was a children's choir. I was in that at one point. Then there was a male chorus. And then there's what we call the M.L. King Choir. That Dr. Daddy King had his own choir. And they were different from the others because they didn't use the big pipe organ up in the choir stand. They used on the floor the Hammond B3 organ, which is what you find in jazz and blues and everything. Yeah. So that was always my favorite choir because of the Hammond B3. And I remember sitting up there and listening to the organist walk the bass lines with his left foot. Man, I used to love that choir, man. And and uh, and when I first heard Calvin Basie, I said, "Oh, that's the same thing I hear every church, hear every um, month in church." It was the same thing to me, same exact thing, about the same size. Uh, the you know the bass, I just knew that Basie was more sophisticated musically, harmonically, I guess you know, but I could connect with it immediately because the feeling was the same. So that's kind of how I got into music and jazz. And then when I got in fifth grade, I began playing trumpet. Uh, and my high school band director, and it was always easy. It was never difficult. The trumpet was always easy for me. I mean, I practiced, but it was never one where I struggled and like I can't do something. I always could figure out something if I wanted to do it. And then my high school band director realized that I had, he told me, I, you know, I have some talent and you just need to have it refined, so you better get a private teacher. And I got a teacher, and the rest is history. But I was always exposed to it, so that's kind of how I got into music. Interesting that you you said trumpet was always easy to you. Uh, if I mm -hmm. if I understand correctly, your first choice of instrument wasn't the trumpet; it was actually the violin. That's right. That you asked your mom to That's go right. pick up. That's right. But, but <laughs> she didn't. Violin. No, she didn't. Because do, what do we know was, why? Uh, no, I found out later on what happened. She went to the store to get the violin, and all of the other parents were there getting their they're getting their kids instruments too, because that's what at that time that particular day that's what everybody was doing. So when she got there, uh, she told me later that the line for the violin side of the store, it was a big music store that was connected. One side was strings, the other side was brass. And so she got into the line for the violins, and the line was too long. The line was like out of the door. She said, I'm not standing in this line. And she went next door to the brass side, and nobody was in line over there. And so she saw a trumpet, and she got the trumpet and came home with that. And that was it. And I, did, I never looked, I never questioned it at all. I wonder what would have happened if she did bring back the violin. Oh, man. You know, man, I hate to even think, man. I, 
That's a good question, but I don't even <laughs> no, I don't even know, man. I don't even know what would happen. Yeah. What what I love is the fact that you were expecting a violin. She comes mm-hmm. home and she brings you a trumpet and mm-hmm. it didn't matter to you. Didn't matter. I just took, I started playing right right away. And my older brother played trumpet a little bit, so he taught me my first song, which was uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb. And I just remember it being easy. I could just play it. It was no, it was never an issue. Never an issue, man. And uh, so that was fifth grade. That was exactly 49 years ago this month, because it was September 1974. So I've been playing trumpet for, four, yeah, September 1974. So I've been playing for 49 years now. Wow. But how is it that mm-hmm. it's, it was, it came so easy to you? Because I can't it imagine just, music. It, it felt like, yeah, it just felt like a natural extension. You know, I, it was almost as if I could talk through it. You know, usually you have to show kids or somebody that's first starting how to hold their lips or how to, you know, pucker their, whatever. I don't have, I don't remember having to do any of that. I just remember putting it to my face and playing. I, I do. I just that's, that's what I remember. That's and, impressive. Uh, probably maybe because I watched my brother play. And I looked at him, but it was just easy, man. And it was a. Uh, I remember the sound. I remember how the notes felt, and they still feel the same. Real big and fat. I remember all of that, and it was never an issue. So once I began really getting serious about it and practicing all the time, I was always first chair and above my peers in the school and college, wherever I would go, I would always be the top player, one of the top players anyway. How much did you work at? You said it came easy to you, but mm-hmm. I presume, you know, being what you've accomplished with, with the instrument, you, you've put in a mm-hmm. lot of hours into this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the turning point was when the United States Army Band came to my high school. I think I was ninth grade, Army Band. And when they came to the school, they bought the, uh, the wind ensemble and they bought the big band, the jazz band. So it was two bands that they had grouped there. But what I noticed was there was one player, one trumpet player that was in both bands. He was the only one that was in both bands. And I remember seeing that. I remember, wow, he's playing both styles. You know? So after it was over, I went up to him. I just started asking him questions. I remember asking him really wild trumpet questions, technical questions. I remember that. And then my band director saw me talking to him and said, why don't you, you know, you should get this guy and study with him, you know? So the next day or two, I'm in band, at band practice, and my band director said, did you call, did you call the, the guy yet to play trumpet and set up lessons yet? I said, no. He said, let me, let me tell you something. If I see you tomorrow and you haven't called this guy, I'm taking my belt off. <laughs> That's an exact quote, man. That's an exact quote from my band director. And see, they could do that back in those days. We're talking 1978, <laughs> 79. They could do that back then. The good old so days. he basically threatened me. He basically threatened me in a nice way. He said, if you don't call. So I called the man, and I started taking lessons. And from the very first lesson, uh, he made the trumpet even easier because he showed me how to unlock the technical aspects of it. There are three basic fundamental technical areas to playing the trumpet. Three basic areas. And if you can master each of these areas, there's nothing you can't play. And when he told me that, I was like, What? And he was right. And I tell my, I, I show my students that all the time. It's three basic areas. Tonguing, you know, single, well, if a trumpet player is going to know, listen to this, single, double, and triple tonguing. So tonguing, that, that'll cover your attack, your finesse, your cleanliness of playing. Then lip flexibility is the muscles that keep your muscles strong here. That'll round out your sound, give you your range and your lower register, you know, just flexibility. And then f- the last one, finger dexterity, being able to play really tricky things with the fingers. So every trumpet solo that you hear, whether it's jazz, classical, funk, rock, Latin, no matter what it is, you can break it down into those three areas. So now that I, well, now that I understand that, I'll, now I know how to go practice. So every time I practice, even to this day when I'm warming up, I cover those three areas. So there's nothing that I'm not ready to play. That, and that just made the instrument even more, not even easier, but it unlocked the possibilities of it. And I had more fun and so I never, that's why I never failed an audition for nothing, because I knew I, what I needed to practice, you know. So any solo, I tell my students, any solo, no matter how hard you think it is, if you know how to break it down, you can play it. <laughs> so I've always had that in my mind. And uh, so, I, you know, I've come across, I've taught a lot of students, man. I've seen a lot of students just, literally, I've had students in tears because they can't do something. And the only reason they're in tears is because the person that they had teaching them before didn't know what to show them. So once I show them what to do, and it's basically easy. We're just talking three areas. But then what you have to do every time you practice, if you've got an hour to practice, divide it up into three areas. And you will nail it, and you'll just get better and better and better and better and better and better. And that's kind of what happened. I have to thank my high school band director, but I really have to thank my trumpet instructor. My friend, His name is Dr. Kevin Eisensmith. And he and I are still in touch to this day. And I have to, But he was the one that unlocked the instrument for me, man, and showed me how to really go about it. And then when I met Winton, when I was 17, 
And to see him playing, I'm sat you know two feet in front of his bell for three hours in London at this club in London when I first met him, and to hear the trumpet being played like that, oh my God! And he was doing all of the stuff that my teacher told me, all the three areas. Just listen to all the stuff he's doing. Okay, now I know what to do. <laughs> so it's a matter of just doing that. But your teachers, not just one, but many teachers, have shaped mm-hmm. who you are and influenced you mm-hmm. in a great way. That I mean, yeah. They've created a lot of opportunities for you and suggested a lot of different things yeah. for you. Yeah, I mean, by the same high school band director that told me to get the teacher, he walked up to me one day, and out of the blue, in the hallway, he said, look, man, Count Basie is in town, and you're going to see him. Simple as that. That's all. He walked off. I said, oh, okay. And I went to go see Count Basie that night. Changed my life. I mean, who it changed, knew, changed your I life in, in what way? Like, what, what did you... Because yeah. because I saw I saw this group of musicians playing together, and they were creating a feeling and a sound, a collective feeling and sound. I was in the front row, and as a matter of fact, someone it was at it was at a high school in Atlanta called Druid Hills High School. My nephew actually went to that high school uh, in the eighties, but it was called Druid Hills High School. And someone on YouTube about four or five months ago posted a video from that concert. Because it must have been from the local news uh, station or something that you know was sh- showing that Count Basie was in town, and I happened to see it and I was like, man, that's the exact. It was January fifteenth, nineteen eighty, Dr. King's birthday, and I was at that concert and they were showing you know footage of the band. And I kept thinking, man, they're gonna pan because had they panned to the front row, I would have seen myself there. But what happened then is that that when I first saw them the first time live. It was a feeling of uh, sophisticated. It was all these feelings rolled into one. But what happened two years later, I saw him again live in Atlanta. And that was when I met the whole band. That's when I knew I would be in the orchestra one day. I met the whole orchestra, man. They were were playing at the Fox Theater in downtown Atlanta. I went again. I went to go to to the country by myself. I didn't go with anybody. And when the show was over, I had to walk across the street to wait for my parents to come pick me up. They said, we'll pick you up across the street in front of the hotel. You know, there's a hotel right there to pick you up. So I'm standing there waiting on them, and I happened to look to my left, and the entire Count Basie Orchestra, except Mr. Basie, was crossing the, in a crosswalk crossing the street from the side of the theater. I didn't know I was standing right in front of the front door of their hotel. I didn't know. But they were coming back into the hotel. So I'm standing there, and all of these guys, they had on their brown three-piece band suits. I remember that. And they were all walking by me with their case, Freddie Green, everybody. And I was just saying this. I'm a, I'm a 17-year-old kid. I'm like, hello, how you doing? Hello, how, you know, whatever. And one of them, I remember him being a trumpet player, one of the trumpet solos, because I, I have a photographic memory. I, can, I just remember stuff, right? So he walked by, and I said, hey, I play trumpet, too. He said, you do? He said, well, come on inside and have dinner with me, young fella. I said, uh, okay, <laughs> you know. And so I'm standing there waiting on my parents. So I went inside, and his name was Sonny Cohn, by the way. Sonny was in the orchestra for 30 years. And uh, so he and I sat at a, at a table right by the window, and uh, we started talking trumpet stuff. And as I sat across from this guy, I could feel and I could see the wisdom on his face. He had been around the world 300 times, you know, played all 50 states, all cut, everywhere, man. I could see that on him. And we just started talking trumpet stuff. And he said, well, about the, just about the stuff you're telling me, I could tell that you really can play. I said, well, you know, I'm trying, you know, whatever. So meanwhile, my parents are driving up and down the street. They're looking for me. And I finally get their attention. I wave, and they see me waving, and they pull over, put their hazards on, and they just sit there and wait. That's how my parents were, man. They were great. They didn't come inside. What are you doing? They just sat there and waited, you know? And so we were talking. They said, why don't you come back in the morning and meet Mr. Basie? We're going to leave the hotel at 10 o'clock. Uh, why don't you come back at 930? Bring your trumpet with you. Bring whatever books you, whatever, just whatever. Just come back and see us at 930. So I got when I got to meet with him, man, I got in the car. I was so excited. My mom and dad were so excited, too. They said, what? They want you to come back and meet the band? Said, yeah, yeah. So next morning, my mother took me down there. But it also happened to be the same day that I had to audition to play the, last, the national anthem for the Atlanta Braves game, the baseball team. So I had that appointment, too, like at 10 or 15 or something or whatever it was. So it was going to be kind of close. So I got there at 930, man, took my trumpet, and it was me, Freddie Green, Eric Dixon and Sonny Cohn, all sitting at this round table. Freddie Green was flipping through my photo album, looking at my little medals and my certificates and stuff. Sonny had my trumpet. I had a Con Constellation trumpet at the time. He was messing with my trumpet, and Eric Dixon was just sitting there. And so I'm sitting there with these guys, and it was at that moment I knew I would be in the orchestra someday. I didn't know when. I I wasn't even worried about it. There was no pressure. I just knew. Some things you just know, and I just knew. And I said... 
and I just had that I had a sort of a kind of reserved kind of a matter of fact feeling. Okay, it'll happen. That was June of 1982. I got called to join the orchestra January 1993. So, you know, that's kind of what happened, man. That's how I ended up, you know, kind of knowing I would be in the orchestra one day. And Mr. Basie, I never met him personally. He was still up in his room. And uh, he never came downstairs by the time I had to leave. But, you know, I've had dreams and stuff with him. And, and it's a whole nother, it's, So I put it this way. I'm, I am where I'm supposed to be. There's no doubt about it. And it was supposed to happen. What a nice thing for them to do to a young mm -hmm. aspiring musician to, to yeah, sit yeah, down and talk yeah. to you and and obviously make a um, an incredible impression on you. Yeah. That I, yeah, I, they, had, they had to know, man. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, if, before that meeting, were you, were you going to be a musician anyway? Oh, yeah. I already, I already knew that. Now, that happened... Uh, one night, I was in high school, I think I was 8th or ninth grade, this was before, you know, 8th or ninth grade, and I remember I couldn't sleep one night, and uh, and at that time, we had these, you know, everybody used to have a set of encyclopedias, you know, like Encyclopedia Britannica, everybody's yeah. room or whatever, so I remember it was about 2, I just couldn't sleep one night, man, and I woke up, and I'm thinking, I mean, I was like tossing and turning, so I said, well, let me just read something, and I had a set of white and Burgundy Encyclopedia Britannica's at the foot of my bed on the wall, against the wall on the shelf. I said, let me just read something. Let me pick, what letters should I pick? I said, oh, I'll pick M for music. Just like that. I said, well, I'll just pick M for music. So I get to pull the book out, I turn to music, and, I'm, and as I'm reading, and it's talking about Gregorian chants, and it's talking, you know, all this stuff, man, but as I'm reading more and more and more, I literally felt like a, like a, like an inferno had been lit inside me. I could feel the fire for my passion for what I was reading. And I'm just reading. I'm not even listening to it. And just reading about it, I felt that fire, that passion, and I knew then, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm a musician. I knew right then and there, that's what I will be doing for the rest of my life. That, that's, what, what, that's what my passion would be. I just knew it because I could feel it from simply reading about it. I'm just reading about Bach and, you know, Monk and whomever, whatever was in this encyclopedia, you know, book under under M for music, and I remember thinking, man, this I, I couldn't get enough of it. So from that day on, every single day I was doing something, trying to teach myself more about music, practice harder, learn more, listen more. I just went crazy with it, which is what I still do. You know, learning as many instruments as I can, reading about it, listening all the time. That that that, that night is what is what started that, and I don't know whatever led me to do that it led me to do that and so that's how it happened so once you decided that you were one day going to be in orchestra how did mm -hmm. you was the main focus just to be in the orchestra because because i have a feeling it wasn't no. it was to play no, no. music but hopefully wind up in an orchestra what was the course my main focus was to be the best trumpet player i could be and best musician i could be i didn't think i didn't have the count bc orchestra as a goal it was in the back of my mind, like I knew I would be associated somehow with them. But what happened, after I saw Basie that summer, when I met the whole band, the next month I met Winton. But he, he, actually, when I, before I met him, two months before that, I saw him on television. And when I saw him on TV, that fire, that inferno that had started, now it's a blazing, it's a blazing inferno now. When I saw him on Johnny Carson that night, I said, oh man, I knew that's what I was supposed to be doing because I could see somebody doing what I knew I was supposed to be doing. It just clicked. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. Sure enough, that's how my life has been. Small group, big band. That's exactly what, is, what had happened. And I ended up meeting him two months. I saw him on TV April of 82. I met him in July of 82. So what is that, three months? But when I met him, and then I could see him live and standing and talk to him and hang out with him. And we've been friends since then, which is since 1982. And we've recorded together. We've toured together since then, all that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, so things just happened for me in a way that, it was just one thing led to, it was just, I guess, fate or whatever you want to call it. It just kind of happened. And I, and I listened and I knew exactly what, what was going on, what, what, what it was telling me. Okay, this is what you're supposed to do. So from all of those things, the underlying message of it all to me was just keep getting better as a musician. Just keep getting better as a trumpet player. Learn everything. Just be a better. I'm always, I just want to be a great musician, man. All this other stuff. You can't plan all this other stuff. You can't plan getting called to join the Basie Orchestra. You can't plan getting called to, to play with Winton or whatever, or Marcus Roberts, these people I play. You can't plan that, but you can control that. But what you can control 
is getting better every day with your skill set, which is what I'm I still do. I'm still working on piano and composing, arranging, whatever. So that's the music part of it has always been my strongest motivator for anything. I'm just trying to get better. And usually when you get to a certain level in your profession, usually things will start happening for you. I wonder, like, was it always going to be jazz? I mean, it sounds like it, but I know you played it. No, I started, no. My, my first trumpet teacher, he was, I was a classical trumpet teacher. I have students now that I only teach classical trumpet to. I don't teach jazz to everybody. Sorry, I but, love classical music. Yeah. Sorry, but as a player, did you always think that you would be jazz, or were you thinking that you could be a classical trumpet player? Oh, I could be, I, could, I did both. I, I was always doing both. I never, ever strictly did jazz. As a matter of fact, to this day, I've never had a jazz trumpet teacher, ever, in my life. I just had the records. Now, I've had classical trumpet teachers, where you work out of the Charlie Method books, and the Hummel and the Haydn and the Flight of the Bumblebee and the Colonel of Venice, all these solos. And I still do that. You know, I still warm up on those things. But I never looked at my career as, as I'm going to be a jazz trumpeter or a classical trumpeter. I'm just trying to do both because that's what Winton represented to me. Winton represented both. You could do both. And I always tried to just, I always tried to keep a, a good level of, of both of them. So when I'm teaching either one, it's a professional experience with whomever I'm dealing with. Like one of my former students, uh, I taught him classical trumpet for five years of his high school years. And when he graduated as a senior, he got a full scholarship, full, to Oberlin. Classical trumpet, no jazz at all. At all, man. So, and I had to work with him on those things. This is, how, you know, and I know that material too. So this just so happens that jazz is what got me into my career and what pays my bills. You know, that sort of thing. But I love to do both. I just want to be a good trumpet player. I don't care if it's classical jazz or not. I love both equally well. And uh, But Winton has been a great example of how if you dedicate yourself to both, and you can, you can master both, which is what he's done. And so he's been like a one of my major, major inspirations, man, to see somebody and to know him, to watch what he's doing and see what his dedication level is, his work ethic, and see how you can you know, take those three basic fundamental areas of the trumpet and really, and just play those ad nauseum until you just, ma you can't, there's nothing you can't play. Nothing. And there's nothing that this cat can't play and that, that he hadn't recorded. So he's always been an inspiration to me as far as the instrument of the trumpet itself goes, you know. And, uh, and from that, you just try to get better and better and again, hopefully things take care of themselves. Is your approach to playing the trumpet very different from being a classical musician to being a jazz musician? Uh, no. Well, the trumpet itself, I have a... For the trumpet itself, my approach to trumpet is, a, is, is as a classical foundation first. Meaning, I'm trying to make sure my armature is set properly, as if I'm playing the Haydn trumpet concerto. That's the same... Every time I put the trumpet to my mouth, that's what I'm thinking. How would I play the Haydn? How would I play a great etude or something? That same feeling... But in a split second, I can begin improvising in the jazz context, which is when you look at Winton play, you can't tell what kind of music he's playing. Or any great trumpet player, you shouldn't be able to tell what they're playing, jazz or classical. You know, so for me, I, I, I have the, I like to try to keep the basic fundamental approach, which allows me to play the full range of the instrument. And some, some musicians, some trumpet players, professional, professional trumpeters, didn't play the full range of, I mean, as wide a range of the instrument as some people, you know, can play. And there are certain players that were limited in their range a little bit. They were limited in certain things. I don't want to be limited by anything. And the way around that is that you take the classical approach and you go through these etude books and these method books and you be able to play that stuff, you know? And so that's my first approach when I'm dealing with any trumpet student, whether it's classical or jazz, we take the instrument first. The instrument is first and foremost. Once you can master that, then you can play whatever you want to play. I don't care what you play. But you got to be able to master that instrument so you can go either way equally well. And, and my, my motto when it comes to playing trumpet is maximum results with minimal effort. Is it, is it just those two musics? Or I get the feeling that you would be a type who would love all kinds of music. And, and, oh, man, I did a record with George Clinton, man. I did, a, <laughs> I, did a, I did a funk record with him. You know, I play with anybody. Earth, Wind & Fire, I've done funk, Latin jazz. I've done all I'm, anything. I don't care. I love to play klezmer music. I've done that. That's some hard music, too. Plasma music, I did some of that in South America years ago. But I love to play the trumpet band. And, you know, I, 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 marching band, I've done that. Um, just whatever, man. So I like to play the trumpet. The hardest music to play is jazz, obviously. And the people don't understand that. Either they don't, either they don't, they don't understand jazz. Because in jazz, 
you have to be, you're basically dealing with the unknown. And you really can only go so far as your technique will allow, your technique will allow you to go. And uh, it's, it's difficult to play this music, which is why we don't have any child prodigies in this music. I point that out quite a bit when I'm doing a lecture or something all the time. So how many child prodigies do you know we have in jazz? Like in classical music, right now you can go find three, four, or five-year-old kids that can play Bach, Beethoven, Bach. You don't have that in jazz. You don't have no four-year-old kid that can play the music of Duke Ellington, or Monk, or John Coltrane, or Miles, or Dizzy, or Bird. No, that'll never happen. It takes too long to learn how to play this music. You know, it takes it takes a long time. Not that kids can't play it, but it's it's just too much. Jazz is like Quincy Jones even pointed out. Jazz is one of the few musics in the world where you use both sides of the brain at the same time: your motor skill side and your creative side. In classical music, like Winton pointed out years ago, it's basically like being an actor. You just have to have to bring a role to life. Is what you have to do. But in jazz, man, you got so many variables, man. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's almost difficult to teach it. It's like Ellis, Ellis Marsalis said, it's like trying to catch a snake. I mean, how many ways are you going to do that? I mean, you can do it, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So for me, it's just, you know, um, I just like to be, I like to be someone who, who is, that when you come, in, come into my, ha- my, my house here or my apartment or my office or wherever, I just like, I listen to, I'm dealing with Mahler's symphonies right now. As a matter of fact, I'm reading a book called Mahler and the, and the Ten Symphonies That Changed the World. I love Mahler's seventh I love his third symphonies. I'm listening to him too. I listen to everybody, man. Uh, uh, Al Jarreau. I was listening to Al Jarreau this morning. <laughs> you know, Buddy Guy. So music is a great thing, and I just like. I don't like to be limited just because I play. People know me as with Count Basie Orchestra. When I'm on the bus and the planes and we traveling with my headphones on, man, I could be listening to anything. And the guys know that too. Tell me this. So anyway. um, when I interview, I've, as I said, I've interviewed a lot of people from a lot of different genres. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. a lot of people love jazz, whether it be rock musicians or classical musicians. And they'll say, yeah, I play jazz, but I'm not a jazz musician. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of understand that. But can you define a jazz musician to me? Like, yeah, a, a jazz musician is someone who has creativity at his core, his or her core. Uh, and someone who never does the same thing twice. I think... When they say that, they are meaning that they haven't sat down and literally studied how to become a jazz musician, what, what you have to do to become a jazz musician. Well, and also that it, it might to. be a lifelong endeavor. Like, it's not... Just... Oh, it is. Absolutely. It's, it's, all, it's definitely a lifelong endeavor. Absolutely. And you just keep, you have to just keep growing. And the key to being a great jazz musician, you have to surround yourself with people that think like you think. You have to have the right people, man, around you. And if you don't, you could be you could you could be practicing with a band that never gets better, and yet nobody will know it, you know. So, jazz musicians, it's a very serious thing, man. It's, I remember to give you an example. When Winton was on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, that particular night, because this always struck me, it's still to this day it sticks with me what happened. Uh, the guest host that night was Bill Cosby, and you know Bill Cosby's a huge jazz fan, mm-hmm. man. I mean this guy, so. I'm watching the show. I didn't know Winton was going to be on that night. You know, my parents used to let me stay up to see Doc Severinsen, you know. So I didn't know Winton was going to be on the show that night. I'm just watching the show. You know, I'm watching the show, and I'm laying there. And they come back from a commercial, and Bill Cosby has Winton's album on the front, on the desk, you know, right there on, on the set. And I remember I had heard his name. It was a strange sounding name, Winton Marsalis. You know, I remember a buddy of mine telling me about this young trumpet player that really, that would be double-tonguing and triple-tonguing in his solos. Now, that's a, just a technical thing, but... I kind of heard of it. So when Bill Cosby put his album on the, on, in, in front and center and the camera zoomed in, Bill Cosby said, and I quote, I want this young man to marry my daughter. Now think about how deep a statement that is for a man to say that on national TV about an artist. But when I thought about it over the years, it's like, you know what? Bill understands that jazz musicians are some of the smartest people to ever walk this earth, man. Some of the most creative, some of the most intelligent to ever walk this planet. That's where he was coming from with that. And I, he, to say, for him to say that, because when he first said it, I was like, what? Is he, what? And as I got into the music and I began to understand what it really took to become a jazz musician, I said, ah, that's why he said that. He wanted his daughter to marry the smartest, to, to marry into a group of, you know, somebody who was among a group of people that were the most intellectual, the smartest, the hippest, the, all of that stuff, man. So jazz musicians, I mean, people that aren't jazz musicians, they, 
the ones that understand what it needs to be, what it takes to become one, if they don't begin to do that work themselves, at least they know. So you'll, the people that you interview were saying, if they say they're a rock musician or whatever, but not a jazz musician, that's because they understand. That's a whole level of work that has to be done in order to be able to be comfortable to be called that. Like if you, for example, that's a went was getting in trouble with critics earlier because critics will be elevating Kenny G to Charlie Parker. Those are two different things, man. Kenny G and Charlie Parker, that's like, no. No, 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 no. Right. So anyway, when you really understand, understand what it takes to become a jazz musician, and some classical musicians, which is why, you know, jazz used to be, and still is in some areas, a four-letter word on some, you know, universities, man, in some circles, you know, until people started understanding what we, what we were doing. And uh, classical musicians, a lot of them, oh, jazz musicians, they just get up and they just play what they feel. That's not what we're doing. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. <laughs> you know? So anyway, the music is very difficult, man. But it could, you could do it. You just got to dedicate your life to doing it. So, and just so happens, to, yeah. Because you, you've split between classical and jazz, and not split, mm-hmm. but you've dedicated a lot of time to both, what do mm-hmm. you consider yourself? Or just do you consider yourself? Because the other thing is when I, I did an interview with Branford Marcellus, and, mm-hmm. and I was talking to him about his work with Sting. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, well, it's all music to me. And it mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't mm-hmm. like, well, I'm a jazz musician. I don't do other things. It was more like, it was very obvious that, no, 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 it's not about labels. It's about music. Yeah, exactly. That's how, exactly. But how, if I was to ask you, what kind of musician are you? How would you answer that? I would say, a mus- I'd say, I would say I'm a musician that likes to play great music. I just happen to be known as you know, someone that's their career has been ninety five percent jazz, you know, because I'm in the Count Basie Orchestra. The recordings I do are mainly jazz, and that kind of thing. That's not to say that I would turn down getting a call to do something else. I wouldn't turn it down. I still I would do it, you know. But it's just like my my focus and my passion has been with the Basie Orchestra and jazz musicians and jazz music. That's just where my passion has been. You know, it's the it, it allows me the most creative freedom. It allows me the most um, uh, experimentation. And, you know, uh, it's just, in, it's an endless, endless uh, uh, path of creativity, basically, that never gets old, ever. Every time I do an arrangement of a song, I'm working on some arrangements now. Uh, I'm, do, I'm doing an arrangement of this tune called I Thought About You for a vocalist, uh, Vanessa Rubin. But that song has been recorded about 50 or 60 times. So now I get to sit down and I get, I'm going to go listen to at least 20 or 30 of them, see what they're doing. Everybody's different. And then I'll be able to sit down at the piano and come up with my own arrangement. You can't do that in any, in any other kind of music, hardly, really. And I can make it rich. I can make it with a blues tinge to it. I can put it in a Latin groove. I can put it in a ballad groove. I can make the tempo fast. I can make it slow. I can change keys. Heck, I can go through all 12 keys if I felt like it. So that level of possibility is most most appealing to me. And I, that's what Branford is saying. I mean, that, that is, jazz, is, it gives you so many more variables to deal with. But on the other hand, also, it could be very daunting. That's very difficult, man. To, to, it's like if somebody told you, get in your car and drive to the grocery store. Now, if you got 50 different ways you can get there, that might be a hard decision to make. Right. The same way in jazz. Somebody tells me to do an arrangement, ask me to do an arrangement or something. Man, it's unlimited what I can do with that. So that in itself can be difficult. Uh, if you don't know how to organize your thoughts and organize what you're trying to do. so. But if you were to ask me what kind of musician I am, I'd say I'm a musician that loves to play great music. Classical, jazz, Latin, funk, swing, klezmer. I mean, I enjoy playing the klezmer music. Right? I love doing it every day. You know, I absolutely love that because it was a challenge to get the music right technically. You know, uh, I love marching band music. I love R&B. I love, I grew up playing that stuff. James Brown, I mean... You know, my dream, one of my dreams was, I used to joke about this with my friends, but one of my dreams was to get a call to be in Michael Jackson's trumpet section, to be in his horn section. <laughs> and the main reason that would have been great because I would have made about $100,000 a week. <laughs> I, I said, you, you kidding me? If he had called me to do that with Basie, I, uh, Basie, I'll be back. I love y'all, I'll be, but I'm going to go make this money <laughs> and play these two or three notes a night. I'll be back. But, you know. It's uh, that's what happened with Branford, man. He left Winton's band and went to go play with Sting. Yeah, you know, he had a whole new thing that happened for him to do that. Right. And uh, so, anytime a musician can make a great living playing music, that's always a good thing. But I just love to play great music, man. That's it. Okay, so you're you're a featured soloist. 
um, or I guess I, are you still considered feature soloist in the yeah. basement? Yeah. So, well, not fee- Well, I still play my solos. Yeah. Okay. So, but you're a director mm-hmm. of the band. Um, mm-hmm. But you were sitting in front of a piano, and you just talked about working on arrangements. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. I know that the piano is important to you. When did the piano become yeah. an instrument for you? Well, what happened uh, in ninety eighty three, starting in nineteen eighty three, I had brace. I had to have braces on my teeth, and I wore braces for two and a half years. And I had no problem playing with them on. I did marching band, all the stuff I normally would do. But when they took the braces off, when I went home to Atlanta to have them taken off, it was discovered that I had about forty percent bone loss. The, the orthodontist really screwed me over. I had surgery about 10 times. I couldn't play for a year. And in that time of time frame of a year, because I couldn't play trumpet and having surgery all every other week, my instructor at school said, well, you're going to learn piano. You're going to get on piano. So every day I was on piano. So now on piano, it's my second instrument. You know, I learned, I became a pianist in our big band on, at school. I became the pianist in a small combo. And I just fell in love with it. Plus, I was getting my degree in music education, and when you get a degree in music education, you are required to take two years of classical piano. So I was already taking that too, and so I had to give a recital in classical piano and all that. So, so that's kind of what happened as far as me really getting into the piano. And by the time I could play trumpet again, I was a much better musician because then I could arrange, I could compose. I was all the stuff under the piano. So now it's an indispensable part of what I do. When I'm teaching trumpet players or anybody, my students, I'm at the piano. I play trumpet when I have to, if I need to show them how to do something or try it this way or whatever. But mainly I'm at the piano so I can give them the foundation. When we playing through a chord, you know, with this Dizzy's tune. If you go through any tune, you know, I, I can show them what the chords are. And if they, don't, if they play a note that's not right, I'll stop them and say, look, this is the chord, play the scale. Now play the chord. So the piano is just indispensable when it comes to learning how to play this music, especially if you're going to be a soloist. There's no way around it. And every great, and I, t- and I also explain it to students, so I said, think about this. 95% or probably greater, maybe 98% of all of the greatest music ever written and composed by human beings was composed at the piano. Bach, Beethoven, Handel, Monk, Chopin, Duke Ellington, Winton. So why wouldn't you want to have a basic understanding of this? You don't have to become a virtuoso on it, but at least know how chords work and things like that. So I just started to understand how important the piano was. So once I started understanding that, now when I play trumpet, I'm not thinking one or two notes at a time on my three vowels. I'm thinking this. Same thing Dizzy told Miles. Dizzy told Miles Davis in 1947, you need to learn how to play the piano, man, so you'll know what... What, what, so you can see the full spectrum of what's possible for you to play. That's an exact quote from Dizzy Gillespie to Miles Davis. So all of these great musicians, Dizzy, Bird, Train, they all wrote at the piano. So one night, about two or three years ago, our pianist, on the, we were on tour with the Basie Orchestra. I got a call. We were at Soundcheck, and the pianist hadn't shown up yet. So I get a call on my phone. And I see it's him calling. I'm like, oh, man, what, what's up? Well, he got stuck in Denver, man. He could, his flight was canceled. It was bad weather. I had to play piano the whole night. And conduct and play my trumpet solos. But I knew every tune. I knew how to play like Basie. Just spark. I, so had I not known how to play piano, we would have been in trouble that night. So it saved me, too, on a couple of instances. You know what I mean? So I sat down so you got to be pretty good, though. Yeah, I mean, I work at it, though, man. I play all the time. I work at it. I work. I love to comp. And anytime I'm on the road or in, uh, around town, if I go to a jam session, I, get on, I play piano rather than play trumpet. Because I like to comp. I like to try to... Comping is very, very difficult because you have to really listen to what's happening. But to me, it's the most rewarding. So if I'm playing behind the solo, if I'm comping, you know... Mm. I, try, I love trying to, try to figure out... But I work, I've been working on that stuff for years, man. So it's something that uh, I've gotten to a point to where... I've led, I've led a couple of trio gigs before and I've played some solo piano at weddings. I've done that. and uh, But I'm not by any means a virtuoso. But I can get through a get through a you know a gig you know and uh so that's how i learned piano because of the braces thing and uh so now when i play trumpet i i see I so i see so many more so many more possibilities of what's, what's what i'm able to do when when it comes to playing a tune instead of being able to have one or two possibilities now i got 10 and the piano is what did that so when you decide that you one day you would be in an orchestra um, and then you wanted to pursue both classical and jazz. What what 
path did you take? What did you do to ensure that one day you would be in an orchestra? You know, did you uh, did you have well, a plan? Did you did you know which way again, to go? The, the, the only plan was just being good on the trumpet, whatever my lessons were, whatever I was doing in my lessons, learn the classical repertoire, learn the jazz repertoire. That's really what it came down to. So on the classical side, you know, there's uh, certain method books and etude books that you have to go through that I went that I still, you know, play with and uh, go, have my students go through. There's certain jazz. Jazz, on the other hand, is so many, so many, so much more music, man. Because in jazz, you got at least a, a couple hundred trumpet players that you got to deal with. Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, Freddie Hubbard, Clifford Brown, Woody Shaw, Winton, Nat Adderley, Don Cherry, I mean, Doc Severance. I mean, the list is endless. you got to go through these players and take from them and learn what you can and try to add it to what you're doing, you know, because the vocabulary of jazz trumpet is so much more uh, expansive than it is in classical music, you know. So much more music to learn uh, when it comes to jazz. And again, all of the recordings that people have done in jazz, a lot of that stuff isn't written down. You know, you just, you just have to listen to it and see if you can figure out and try to learn it by ear, you know, and uh, which is why another another area, which is why the music is so difficult and why people, not, not, not everybody can do it, you know. So I just, I, again, I didn't plan to, I didn't try to set, get my skill set to a certain point to where I would be acceptable acceptable in the Count Basie Orchestra or Duke Ellington Orchestra, any orchestra like that. I wanted to get my skill set so I could get called to join any band. Any classical orchestra, any jazz. I just wanted to have my skill set that, that to that level, where I can go play first chair in a New York Philharmonic, and I can do that. I have the skill set to do that, because I, I know exactly what that music is. I know what's required of that, and I know what's required if you get called to join the Count Basie Orchestra, or the Ellington Orchestra, to play the solo trumpet chair. I know what's required there too. That's all I wanted to be able to do, is be able to get a call from anybody and not not have to say, well, you know, I don't think I know how to do that. I don't want to ever have to answer the phone like that. Somebody that calls me for a klezmer gig, or somebody that calls me to play the, the Messiah, you know, the trumpet, the Brandenburg concerto for something. Okay, I, all right, let, let, let me go warm up on it. I'll be there. And to me, that's what's made my life fun. And every day is fun. I can work on a number of things every day. That's what keeps it keeps keeps it uh, exciting. I'm never bored. I'm never bored, man. How do you get better at this stage? Well, it, it, it just it just it's time. I think the way to get the way that I'm finding figuring out I'm getting better is the le- the amount of time that it takes me to prepare for something. That's how I know I'm getting really good at it. It's like when I'm when I'm if I pick my trumpet up now I haven't played when's the last day I played? What's today? Friday? The last day I played it's been three or four days, I guess, something like that. Maybe even a week. I can't even remember now, but about maybe a week. So if I had to do a gig tonight, the warm-up time for me would be about a good 20 minutes. Maybe right around there. It was, if, it was, if it was 30 or 40 minutes, then that's, that's too long. So as I, what I'm saying is over the years I've learned it doesn't take me forever to warm up anymore. You don't have to. I mean, I still have to warm up, but it doesn't take me 20 minutes. Sometimes I can be ready in five, six minutes. I'm ready to go because my muscles are constantly being used. And I'm constantly thinking about it. Um, the older I get and the more I play, the more I get to the less, less effort, you know, maximum results. You know, I keep, I keep going, get, I keep, I keep thinking about that. Uh, but I, I just think it's time. I mean, it's a matter of time. But the only issue with the time problem is, time part of it, the human body wasn't made to play a trumpet. So when I don't play, my muscles go, begin to go back to their natural state. Slowly but surely, they just go, you know, so after about six months, like if I didn't play for six months, it would probably take me a, a day or two to get back, or maybe maybe three or four days to kind of get back to where I really feel, okay, I'm back to my 100% now. But I'd imagine you haven't, I mean, there has been no period where you haven't picked up the trumpet in six months. Oh, no, 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 no. The most I've ever gone when I'm playing, probably maybe two weeks. Like I went on, I took a vacation for the very first time in my life. I've never taken a vacation until a couple months ago, ever, 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 ever. I still can't believe I never did that, but... For the first time ever, I flew, flew down to St. Martin. I didn't take my trumpet, and that was the very first time I didn't take a trumpet. Ever. That I ever, I've ever been on the planet, that I didn't have my trumpet somewhere in my bedroom or the house where I'm staying or wherever it is, you know, hotel room or something. Didn't even take it. Didn't even miss it. Wow. Didn't take it, didn't miss it. Because I, 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 needed, I needed the break. I needed to get back to just, you know, just being a person, just swimming. And just, I mean, not to get back to being a person, but... There are other things than playing a trumpet. There's, you know, you got to rest, you got to have a good time, and I swam every day. I did stuff you know, that I hadn't done before. 
But in my mind, I'm thinking it. You know, and had there, and, there, and there was a band at the hotel, and the people said, "Well, you gonna play it? No, I'm not gonna. Play. I'm coming here to listen. I ain't playing nothing." <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so I know you so, accomplished a lot and played with a lot of great people, but I'm gonna just jump to you joining the Count Basie Orchestra. How did that come about? Because yeah. if this is something you said I, yeah. you wanted to do as a young child, whenever you got that phone mm -hmm. call or however it was presented to you, must have been a great moment. Man, I thought it was a joke, man. I got a call out of the clear blue, clear blue one day from Frank Foster, who was leading the band at the time. And he said, uh, this is Frank Foster. And he said, this is Scotty Barnard. I said, yeah. He said, well, you've been highly recommended to join the Count BC Orchestra. I said, what? I thought it was a joke, man. Like, what? He said, yeah, man, you've been highly recommended to join the orchestra. And we got, we, I'm offering you an invitation. And at that time, I was right in the middle of a solo career. I had a manager and everything. We were trying to get a recording contract. And I'm, on, I'm touring. I'm opening for Dave Brubeck and people like that. So I'm really focused on my solo thing. So I actually told Frank, I said, ah, oh, man, uh, um, I, oh, yeah, let me, yeah, let me, let, can I call you back? I just got to think about it because I was in, I literally had to give up my solo thing. So as soon as I hung the phone, I was like, what the hell am I doing? I called this cat right back. Yes, man. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? That was January 1993. And two weeks later, man, I was on the road. That's been 30 years ago. I've been on the road ever since, man. But that's how that happened. Wow. I got the call to join the orchestra. And uh, and I think what happened after that, the guy whose place I took, his name was Melton Mustafa. And he also was good friends with my instructor. We, we went to the same undergrad, Florida a &M University here in Tallahassee. And uh, the story goes is that Melton's wife wanted him to come off the road because he had a family and all of that. So he called my instructor, Lindsay Sargent, at FAMU, he said, hey, man, you got any students that probably can come in and do this chair and play this gig? He said, oh, yeah, got Scotty Barnard. He can do that. So that's what happened. So they called, he called me up, and, and I've been there ever since. And after about the first year or two there, it was, it was, it was uh, revealed to me that I was already in line to become leader. That, that still blows my mind to this day. I wasn't even thinking about that. Do you but know why? After I came in, like, do you know what was well, it, what is it about you that they had you in mind for that? Well, man, you know, I guess it was my work ethic. I guess it's my professionalism, my my knowledge of the music, my uh, just my, I guess my overall package. I guess I mean, good so, you know, good soloists trying to play the, trying to play the right way with the music, um, volunteering to do stuff that I didn't have to do. You know, I was always doing that. Well, we need somebody to go do this. We need somebody. I'll do it. You know, I would always do. I was always doing that. They made me the union steward, and I was the youngest guy in the group, man. They made me the union steward. Uh, I ended up doing the sound and lights. I mean, taking care of the sound because nobody else would do that. And I saw, and I still do that to this day to make sure the sound's right. And that's been great because I've learned a lot about audio and fidelity and microphones and placement and all that. So I love that. And uh, and then, you know, I just started doing all of this stuff, man. And then one day we did a recording with Tito Puente. This is 1995 or 94, early, yeah, uh, January of 1995. And that day, we were flying to Thailand from New York to Bangkok because we were going to Thailand. But we had to do the recording session in the morning, like at 9 to 12 or something. Then we had a break from 12 to like 4. Then we were going to leave the hotel at 4, going to the airport. So we had a break from 12 to 4. So we had a 17-hour flight to go to Bangkok, right, from, from JFK. So I said, well, let me go down here to the bookstore and get a book of two to read for the flight. You know, just kind of, you know, make the flight short. So at that time, the Basie offices were on 57th Street, right across the street from Carnegie Hall. That's where the offices were. And the bookstore that I was going to was right next to the Basie office, or right across from Carnegie. So I had to go by the Basie office to get to the bookstore. So as I'm walking by the Basie office, Basie's son, who was our CEO at the time, Aaron Woodward, he was coming out of the door because he was going on the trip too. He was coming out of the office. So he sees me. He says, hey, he says, hey, man. He said, hey, by the way, man, he's talking to me. He said, hey, man, I need to see, I need to talk to you about something. And I'm thinking, oh, shit. Because, you know, if the boss said, you know, I need to talk to you about something, I'm like, damn, what did I do, man? <laughs> did I do what, you know, what did I do, man? So anyway, come to find out when he finally, he called me, he didn't talk to him on that trip, but he called me a month or two later. He said, uh, by the way, you're next. I said, what are you talking about? He said, you're next. And then I got what he was saying. I said, oh, man, I, began, I literally began shaking, man. I began shaking because it was something that I had maybe in the back of my mind thought about one day, but not thinking about only being here for two or three years. Well, I don't know that. But then I thought about it and I said, well, first of all, just being, this is not to brag or anything, but to me, 
There's nobody else on this planet that knows this orchestra's music better than me. I'll, I'll challenge anybody on that. Who else knows this music better than me? Now, I don't know anybody. I could talk to you about every single year, every single recording that this band did, how it shifted, what players made it shift. This, you know, That's just what I was always learning and still learn. I love that stuff, man. So then I started thinking about all of those things like that, the practical things, the things that matter. There was nobody else that was more passionate about it than me. Who, who volunteers to do a sound on a whole tour without getting paid for? Who volunteers to go early and do set that stuff up? I'm doing that. Nobody else is doing that. So then when you put all that stuff together, you start realizing, okay, well, he's the one. So explain that to me. Tell me what, what is the role of the director of a Count Basie orchestra? What, what do you have well, to do? Yeah. Well, the first thing to me is understanding what Basie's philosophy was. That's the first thing. And his philosophy was, at, the, at its core, treating the musicians like human beings first and foremost. That's the first step. You mean that you got 17 people, you have to treat them like people, human, be they're human beings. They're not musicians first. They were born as humans. You got to connect, connect on a human level. Then you have to understand what their role and what they're doing in the orchestra, what, you know, and, and treat everybody as in, in it, treat everybody in such a way to where they realize and feel their importance to the group. Everybody feels equally important, which is why if you see us play. I have everybody soloing. We don't have one or two people to take all the solo space. I spread that out amongst everyone, man. So the orchestra itself becomes the focus, not one or two people. And that's what Basie did. Although he was bigger than life, the orchestra is what people came to listen to. They didn't come to listen to him, man, so per se. They came to listen to the group and had the group swinging. That's what they wanted to listen to. So I understood that. That was the first step to understanding that. And then I, luckily for me, I, I got to see how Frank Foster was the leader, how he led the band, what he did, what he didn't do. I got to see all these three or four guys before me, how they led the band, what they did and didn't do, versus what Basie did and didn't do. So by the time it got to me, I had a greater, a greater understanding of how to function as a professional with these guys by making sure that I, had, that I had their respect. That's something I've never had to ask for. I've always had it. But that's probably because what I was doing before I became leader. I didn't, I didn't, all of a sudden, when, when, when the day came, when it officially turned over to me, it wasn't all of a sudden like, uh oh, Scott is leader now, we got to go. No, it was a smooth trans. It was just now I'm in front of the group, you know, doing what we do. So, uh, but basically, being a leader of this orchestra, man, um, you have to be a historian, which I, I, which I am at, at heart. I've always loved learning about everything. Um, and you have to be able to know how to pay attention to detail. And I've always had a photographic memory, so I can hear something and, mem and remember it, or I can see. And I just, I've been quick like that. I just always, that's just always been something I've been able to do. And sometimes, like I can hear if the bass player's E string is flat or sharp. I can hear that. Like if he's playing, and sometimes I can pinpoint exactly what's making that bass not be in tune. I've, I've just always been able to do that. That's just, I don't know if that's something I learned or, the, I don't know, I don't know, but it's there. <laughs> is <laughs> and that, it helps. Is that difficult? Like, if you hear that and it's a little out of tune, it must irritate you a little bit. And then how do you, yeah, it does. How it do does. you communicate that to him without... Well, I, 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 I know exactly, like, for example, we, we, did, we just did this blues recording. We went in the studio back, back in August and we're playing and the bass player played something. I said, either, hey, man, and I stopped the band. I said, hey, either you're out of tune on that E or you're playing the wrong note. He knew. Ex he said, "Oh, I'm playing a wrong note." So okay, I, I could just hear that. You just some stuff you just kind of hear when you get used to, when you listen to music a lot. And I listen to every bass because I'm listening to got bassy in the car right now. I'm listening to all the time, and you just get to a certain point to where you know what something's supposed to sound like. And if you hear anything that's outside of that, you immediately identify. Okay, either that's something different, or they're playing wrong. That's not something's not right there. And then you just stop until you make sure you until you get it right. So I've been able to figure that out. So when I'm standing in front of the band now. And if I hear something that's not right or something doesn't feel right, I know how to fix it. Okay, so the other role as a director mm -hmm. is coming up with a new project idea of which the new blues album yeah. is. And that came from you. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about yeah. the genesis of that idea. Man, look, in 2019, Basie was inducted into the Blues Hall of Fame in Memphis, Tennessee. So I had to go to Memphis and get the award and make a little you know, thank you speech and all that. And But while I was there... They asked me, they said, would you mind being a presenter at our Blues Awards? They had the, it was while the Blues Awards were going on. It's like the Grammys for the blues, right? Yes. I said, sure. I, you know, so I had to read the teleprompter and present the award, and I did that for four or five people. 
But at the table that I was sitting at, I was sitting next to Bobby Rush. And the great Bobby Rush was 89. And I love that man. That's my buddy, man. I'm sitting next to him. And I had known him already before that. And I was sitting next to Muddy Waters' son and then talking to Bernard Purdy, all these great musicians. And it just hit me. It's like, you know what, man? We need to do a record with these people. This is what we need to do. And, 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 and as soon as I thought about it, I said, and it's never been done before. You would have thought somebody like Quincy Jones yeah. would have gotten all these great blues and put them with Basie or Ellen. Nobody thought to do that, which is still mind-boggling to me. That's mind-boggling to me, to not put that together like that. So anyway, that was the first thought. But the problem was there was no, and still it wasn't until now, there was no recorded precedent for what I wanted us to do. I couldn't go check out a recording and say, okay, you know what? It needs to be recorded sort of like that. This is what, yeah. There was nothing for me to go find to check out that I can listen to. I only had blues recordings and big band jazz recordings. And jazz. There was nothing together like that. Right. So I just began to research. I began to buy every blues record I could get in my hands. I spent thousands of dollars. Luckily, I had a budget to do that, but I was able to go, you know, get these recordings and study everybody. Sunhouse, uh, uh, um, what well, Sunhouse was the other guy? Led Bill. I mean, all these people, man, everybody. Charlie Patton. So what happened on the day of March 20th, the next year, after the Blues Awards, we were playing, the Basie Orchestra, we were playing a private wedding reception for this extremely, extremely successful businessman who's worth 10 figures, right? Nine, 10 figures. Very rich guy. And uh, so we're at his house, and we're playing the wedding for him, but that was the day that COVID shut everything down. Mm. So we had almost decided not to do the date because everybody was scared to fly. As a matter of fact, seven of the guys, they just refused to fly because they, nobody knew what was going to happen. You could, you could die. So we were like, okay, well, we can't, we don't want to uh, cancel the gig, so we had to get subs. And we didn't hold it and say, anybody that doesn't want to make it, no problem. It's just a wedding reception. No big deal. We can get some subs. So that's what we did. So we get, we get there, we do the gig, and the only request that they had was for us to play for the bride and the groom for their main dance, uh, Quincy Jones's arrangement, uh, Sinatra, Fly Me to the Moon, which is what, you know, we, we, we play. So we played that, and after that, the groom, I see him walking to the stage. He's walking over, and he says, and I said, yeah, can I help you? He said, yeah, do you mind if I sit in with the band? <laughs> I said, now, every band director will tell you, <laughs> if somebody comes over and says that, that means one of two things. Either they can't play at all, and they're drunk or something, and they want to show off in front of their friends, or they really can play. So I'm thinking, well, it's his house. It's, it's private. Uh, it ain't going to be on YouTube. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. Well, you, you don't know, know so. if it's not going to be on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't know. Yeah, right. So anyway, he said, okay. He said, yeah, that's great because I just bought a 1962 Gibson. Now, I did not know that meant that was a $50,000 guitar. I had no idea. I, so he said, yeah, let me go. I sounds like, damn. So I called the sound guy over to hook him up so we can get ready to play. So he comes back, has his tuxedo on, guitar over his shoulder, man, everything. We can take his wire, plug him in. So I said, well, what do you want to play, man? He said, well, how about some blues? I said, okay. I said, well, well, what key you want? He said, don't matter to me. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> now, when he said that, I said, oh, okay, something this cat can play. Because so, you don't say any, you know, I don't care if you can't play. Right. So I knew he could play. So I said, okay. So I called the key of G for the guys, you know. So I said, I just counted the tempo, off, medium tempo. And I'm counting, and the band starts playing. And let me tell you something, Marco. Let me tell you, this is, I'm not exaggerating. When this guy started playing electric guitar, he sounded like every electric guitar player in history rolled into one. I said, what the living <laughs> hell is this? It was unbelievable, man. It was, and on top, he's a billionaire on top of it. I'm like, what? <laughs> this cat. And so then I had the saxophones. I had them do a riff behind them. Then the trombones do a riff and the trumpets. Now I got the whole band doing a riff behind him. And I said, oh, shit. This is what I've been hearing in my head for a year. This is it. Wow. This is what I've been missing. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is, I finally heard it, man. It came together at that instant. That is what this recording is. Because I finally heard it. I finally had an electric guitar with horns behind them, rip, improvised riffs. Nobody was looking at any music, but this is what it was. I said, oh, man, this is it. So what happened? I was so excited by this. I couldn't believe what I was hearing that I, I couldn't sit still, right? So anyway, fast forward the next day. I'm back here. I'm home here the next day, but on the way home, flying through the airport and driving back to the airport with the rental car for the two hours. Man, I couldn't. I was like, man, I, this is insane. So I said, I got to tell this guy 
what he just helped me to do. So I wrote, I emailed his assistant that we had been in touch with before we got to the part wedding. I emailed, I said, I just wrote a little paragraph saying, blah, 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 this is what happened. I've been trying to hear this in my mind, blah, 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 you know. Emailed it. Ten minutes later, ding, he emails me back. I was like, what? I read the email. He said, oh, man. He said, well, I'm glad I could help, blah, blah, blah. And if you need anything, if you need any help with it whatsoever, let me know. I said, what? <laughs> fast forward the following year. Fast forward another year. No, fast forward a few months. I had set up a meeting with me, him. He flew out on his private jet. John Burke, the record company executive, and Sam Beeler, who's been our sponsor, who's his foundation has paid for our recordings for the last four or five recordings. And I set this meeting up in the living room of Sam's house. And I did it. It was a big party. People outside catered food and everything. Here I am inside with three other businessmen, a billionaire and two millionaires. I'm a hundred air. And I'm sitting there with these cats and I'm in charge because I have an idea that I know could work. Nobody's ever done it before. It would be crazy to do to not do it. So anyway, I get we put the budget down. We did it. Anyway, rest is history, man. We got it done. Uh, you got we got it done, man. Uh, okay, so did the did the billionaire who played the guitar was he on, featured on the album no he was going to be but for business reasons he pulled out okay okay that's a whole other story he basically he basically wanted it wanted it on his label because okay. he has his own label but we had already been with john we've been with john for, i'm not i wasn't gonna pull the world out on the john just because somebody with money comes in and says no i'm not gonna do that right. so as a, for a business decision he, he decided okay well i can't but we were still able to get the rest of the money, raise the money, and we did it, man. He would have been on it had he stayed involved, and I had room for him to play. But because of that, it's like, and we still cool. We still stay in touch, email each other, and everything. And uh, but that's what happened with that. But that's how it happened, man. So then when I got with John, it was just a matter of once we knew we had with the budget, what well, we could do it for uh, the budget, you know. Then we just sat down and came up with the guest list. I went and chose. I chose all of the songs. I must have listened to over five hundred songs. To, to pick out which ones I knew would be the best ones to, to feature everybody on. And then we got together, we got the musicians, and we got the recording date, man, got the arrangements, man, and we did it, man. And it's on freak. It's it's it's, it's, I, I. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful piece of work. So, <laughs> so yeah, you man. chose all the songs. So I, I wondered if you went yeah. to somebody and said, hey, I, we want you on this album, and it's asked them mm -hmm. for their songs, but that wasn't the case. No. So no, the other thing is, good. is it, I can't even imagine how difficult it is to record an album with a big band like this. Is this live mm -hmm. off the floor, or are there a lot yeah. of overdubs? Everything is like one or two takes. With the singer. The only thing that's over, yeah, yeah, except actually most of them see, with the exception of maybe one or two, all of the vocalists and, and guest solos, they overdubbed their part because they weren't in the studio. Right. But the big band tracks, that was all laid down in one or two, one or two takes, no overdubbing any of that stuff except for the solos where, where, where necessary. But a lot of the solos, like the tennis saxophone solos in the studio, all that stuff is live, man. You know, we just did one take, and I'm John here. I say, is that good enough? If not, we do one more take. Never more than two takes. And then when we had the takes uh, done, uh, and we knew who we were going to solo on what, they would send a track to wherever they could record in their studio, whether we knew wherever they were, send the track to the studio, and they would go and overdub the part and send us back the track, and that's it. We do the mixing and mastering, and that's it. It went. We we did. We recorded. Twelve tunes in two days, six each day. Is this big band. typical for the band? I mean, I presume this is for the campaign. Us, yes. Yeah, for us. Yeah, man, we've done. They basically they used to do full albums in a day, man. <laughs> All this stuff. Some some of these musicians take six, seven months to do it. No, that's that's ridiculous. We don't have we don't have to, we don't have, we don't have to do that. Okay. So, so luckily we had we could do it as quickly as we could. So just in general, when when the Count Basie band plays live, when you mm -hmm. play songs, you I presume you're using charts. Mm -hmm. um, when the go when the solo happens, when you take a solo, mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. charted, right? This is all improvised. No. Yeah, to all improvised. Okay, yeah. so all mm -hmm. solos for your orchestra would be improvised. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's never a written solo okay. ever, never, ever, never, ever, ever, ever. And even even as far as as the charts go, we may play the same chart twice, but the orchestra we're still messing with it. We're still not playing it exactly how they played something in 1955 how we would do it in 2005 or 1995. It's still the same chart, but things have shifted over the years, which is why when somebody in, it comes in and they're new and when they join us, the first thing we say to them is that we don't play the music exactly how it looks on the page. What you were looking at is not what we're going to be playing. Right. It's going to be 90% of that, maybe 85, but it's not going to be, so we're going to, you just got to listen to what everybody's doing and you know how to shift 
make something a little longer, a little shorter. And the only way you're going to get it, you just got to listen. So, uh, so in a sense, the orchestra is still improvising, do you even see, as a whole. Do you see a, a chance for, I mean, we should just say that on the album, there are some pretty impressive musicians on the album, including mm -hmm. Charlie Musselwhite, Shemika Copeland, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Keb Moe, Bobby Rush. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see a, an opportunity where you could actually perform this live? Yeah, we, we're trying to, we're working on that, man. It's just expensive. We're trying to figure out how to do it. Um, but we will definitely do it with at least two or three of them. And the only issue is our next, our next schedule for us is Japan. That's in November. Uh, but we need more domestic dates. So it might not be till the spring, you know. And, uh, but we definitely have that in the works, have it, have it planned. As a matter of fact, we just played in Phoenix, Arizona a month ago. And the night that we played, Bobby Rush was playing the next night in the same venue. We ran into him in the hotel. We hung out in the hotel. But had he gotten in town earlier that night, I was going to have him come play with us. You know, but So we're going to try to work that out where we can have, you know, I have a great, my, my, my dream is to have the entire, all the musicians on the album have us open for a major rock group or something. That's what it should wow. be. We should be all on tour together. That would, that would be, man, if we could do that, that would be something. I mean, I would imagine just the way the world is, and also since the pandemic, having, mm -hmm. is it an 18-piece orchestra? I mean, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. it, it can't be easy to be touring an 18-piece orchestra. No, but it could be done. Right. I mean, it could be you know, Lincoln. Lincoln Center went and tours quite a bit. You know, uh, we tour as much as we can. And the, the, you know, when I first joined the orchestra, we were on the road 40, 43 weeks a year, man. Wow. Forty three weeks a year. But now it's probably ten. You know, if that, because the way everything is happening with the pandemic. Now it's getting back up there. You know, we haven't done Japan in three years. Now we're going back this year, going back to Europe again next summer. We were just in Europe a few months ago, so things are slowly co coming back. You know, and uh, but the Basie Orchestra, man, it's going to be our 90th anniversary in two years. Wow. So we're trying to plan some things for that, too. I'm planning, I was planning a, um, a new recording for that. That'll be a strings recording. We haven't done a recording with Symphony Orchestra, so that'll allow us to do more symphony dates. We got the blues thing that now we can play with any blues musicians around. You know, we can do that. And we're just still trying to keep things going and think of new projects to do that keep us relevant and keep us, uh, you know, out there on the road, you know? Um you know, playing the Blues Music Awards would be one possibility because yeah, everybody would I hope be there, so. right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. In fact, I talked to the lady who's in charge of the Blues Awards just yesterday, I mean, the Blues Foundation just yesterday because we're trying to have a listening party there oh, nice. in Memphis the first or second week of October. We try, I actually talked to her yesterday about that. So we're trying to see if we can make that happen. It'll be the first or second week in Memphis at the Blues Museum. And uh, and I know we're going to have some submissions you got to have the submissions in for recommendations for the Blues Awards by October 23rd. So we'll do that. We'll submit the album in certain categories for that, too, just like we're doing with the Grammys. They've done that. And uh, But, yeah, to play at the Blues Awards, that would be great. I mean, we got time to plan it, so why not? Yeah, and you know, we'll a lot of those do. people will be there. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, exactly well, right. it's a fantastic mm -hmm. album, and... and I'm I'm so thrilled to be able to talk to you. Uh, as I said, well, my uh, pleasure, just man. doing the research. You you you're a man who obviously loves what you do. You the passion yes, yes. that you have for music just oozes off the screen. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I do <laughs> want to ask. So, yeah, to be the director of the Count Basie Band, um, and you want to mm -hmm. keep it relevant. You want to keep it going. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How much room is there to change? what the band is as as you move forward change um and i and, and change might not be i mean obviously there's a philosophy and the, there is a reason why the count basie band is the count basie band but mm -hmm. as time moves on how different is the band mm -hmm. today as it was in the 50s or the 30s i 30? think i think i think the band is the same the difference the the key the key to me is the music that we play we got to be keep playing different types of music rather than your regular straight ahead swing. Like we did a record called All About That Basie three or four years ago. And we did Tequila, the song Tequila. We did some tunes by Earth, Wind & Fire, Stevie Wonder. That's the kind of stuff we kind of keep doing. We got to keep playing tunes that more people recognize, but still do them in our way. And the only problem with that is there aren't that many people on the planet that know how to arrange for this orchestra. Mm. When you write for the Count Basie Orchestra, it's not like writing for any other big band. You got to write a certain way. And we, there aren't that many people that I know that know how to do that. 
So when I got ready for this project and the last couple of projects, there's only one or two people that come to mind that I would be that I would trust letting write for us, because otherwise I have to spend a lot of time editing the arrangement. And Basie used to do that too, just because Quincy Jones and Frank Foss and those guys gave the band arrangements. Basie just didn't say, "Okay, we're gonna play whatever he wrote." He would sit there and take stuff out, change stuff. He he did that all the time because he knew exactly what he wanted for his orchestra. So I understand exactly what's needed for us. And if I get an arrangement, and I could tell right away if it works or not. And then, you know, and if, if the guy or lady knows what they're doing, it's worth writing for us. So you can so just look at a piece of paper way. and know? Absolutely. I can look right at it and tell you, because I can see what the, rhythm, what the rhythms are doing. It's rhythm. It's all about the rhythm. If the rhythms aren't written in a certain way to allow us to just be natural and play how we normally would play, we can't do it. We would have to go back and we would have to go through and change some rhythms. And, you know, there's some stuff that I added to the, for example, on the blues record, there's a couple of arrangements that I had to add some stuff to, like a shake, you know, and a shake, yes, die, yeah, yeah, that, you know, when the brass is shaking. There's a couple of instances where that was needed. It was glaringly absent. And I said, I can't believe it. So I said, okay, put a shake here. Because there's certain things that the Basie Orchestra does in a way that no other orchestra does. So as long as we can keep doing that and then keep doing new music, now we could do a, an arrangement of Beethoven's Fifth if it's done right, if it's written right. Matter of fact, that might even be a challenge to do, try to do that. But we can do it if it's done right, you know? Just like I do the arrangement of Beethoven's uh, Sonata Pathétique. Uh. Ah. That's a different arrangement. That's, that's Beethoven's Sonata Pathétique. But that's a jazz arrangement of it. I took the same, same melody notes. I just switched the chords around. So you could, put, you could take any piece of music and, and we could play it as long as it's arranged the right way. So that's what I'm thinking about. When we do these symphony recordings and the other recordings we got coming up, what music can we take? Like I thought about us doing a whole record of um, George Benson's music. Like we were just at George Benson's house two weeks ago. And I thought, I said, man, what, it was, what, it was, what would it sound like if the band did a whole record of his hits, like on Broadway and This Masquerade? And, you know, what would that sound like? Or what if we did a whole record of... Cannibal Adderley and Nat Adderley hits the big hits that they had, like Work Song and Mercy Mercy. So there's a lot of possibilities that we could do, you know, as long as we play them like the Count B.C. Orchestra would play them. That's the key. As a director, is that now just full time? Can you focus on possible solo career or is it? I'm trying to. I got some stuff that's going on, like in my solo career that I'm about. I'm about to do a second recording and I have. The updated version of my book is just about finished. Oh, yes, so and this is to put... important. This is the history mm -hmm. of jazz trumpet. Jazz trumpet, yeah. And I'm, uh, my first book, the first edition came out in 2005, but I wasn't even done researching. The publisher at the time said, well, you got enough. Let's just go ahead and put this out now. I said, oh, okay, all right, whatever. And I had done uh, 15 interviews, actually 21 interviews, with some of the greatest jazz trumpet pioneers ever, but we only put 15 in the book. And uh, But now... I just finished, my interview total now, believe it or not, is 55. Wow. It's unprecedented for any instrument. For I got Doc Severinsen, Arturo Sandoval, John Faddis, Winton, Maina Ferguson, Clark Terry, Fred. Insane, man. But it took me 20 years, almost 20 years to do it. But now it's done. The interviews are finished. They have been, I'm editing them now, and I'm going to kind of tweak another chapter or two. So that is going to be hopefully out in the spring or the summer at the very latest and then my, in, in, in order to support that, to go along with it, will be my second solo record. And I'm already, already got the band set for that, smoking band, my dream band, already got the cats lined up. It's just a matter of planning it and getting to the studio to do it. So that'll, I'm trying to get to the point where I can balance more of my solo stuff with the bassy stuff. Not getting, still do the bass, not getting in the way of that, still do that, but do a little bit more of my solo thing. So that would be a perfect life for me to be able to do a, a week, my solo stuff, Three weeks basically, a week solo. That'd be perfect for me. Teaching too. Still yeah. teaching. I love doing that. So I'm just trying to balance it, you know. <laughs> um, and then mm -hmm. you have to remember that you have, you have to do that documentary about the jazz trumpets, like a, a film. Oh. <laughs> that will be the next part. <laughs> well, you know what, man? Hey, man, I would, I would love to do that. I got a lot of information, man. I got a lot of information. I mean, the, so, the, the interviews for my book, I got everything digitized, digitized too. Oh, I forgot about this. I'm meeting in another week or so. We're going to try to um, maybe begin my own radio show based on my book. Wow. Because I, I got all these interviews, man. I got everybody talking. I got a, literally, you can hear them talking. Clark Terry, Doc Severinsen. I mean, Arturo Fattis, 
uh, Wallace Roney, Terrence Blanchard, Nicholas Payton, Ingrid Jensen, Chris Bodie, and all these are all friends of mine, man. People I've known for years. So when they're telling me stuff, it's it's hilarious, it's serious. And the funniest part about the interviews that I like is that for everybody, the first four or five questions are specifically toward their career, toward them. But the last three or four are questions that I ask everybody the same question. Like I I even do a a name recognition, and this is freaking hilarious, man. So I do, I'll say, I'll say, now I'm going to say something. <laughs> you ain't going to know what it's going to be. But you say the first thing that comes to your mind. Imagine Doc Severson doing that. You imagine what he would say, <laughs> or Arturo, or Thaddeus. But that's what I had. That's what I got. And so, man, I would say, to give you an example, I said uh, to Doc, I said, uh, okay, Doc, I'm going to say something. You just say the first thing that comes to mind. He said, okay, go ahead. I said, um, A minor seven. It's A minor, that's a chord, right. A minor seven, right? So he so he thought for a second. He said, uh, F sharp. Now, for a musician, that's telling. That shows you how he thinks. That you are in the mind of a Doc Severinsen now, what he does to res in response to that sound. That's how he thinks. Now, fast forward to another guy, Jimmy LaRocca, whose father was Nick LaRocca of the original Dixieland Jazz Band in 1917. Nick LaRocca is 85 years old, great trumpet player in New Orleans. And I went to his house, and I asked him the same question. I said, okay, Nick, I mean, uh, John, um, uh, Jimmy, I'm just going to say something. You say the first thing that comes to your mind. I said, okay. He said, okay, shoot. I said, uh, A minor 7, right? He sat there, he thought, he said, man, hmm. Then finally he said, man, I don't have an effing idea. <laughs> and so then, so when you got these two great players, with, and so that's just two people. I did it for everybody. Everybody's answers are just, it's it's fascinating, man. Just, but just out of curiosity, it, what what was yeah. what would have been another word that you gave them? Oh, another word I gave them would be oh, I would say a trumpet player. Okay, I would say someone like Clifford Brown, or I would say um, mainly would be a trumpet player or or chord or something like that. I think that's mainly what I did. And uh, uh, like I, I I told one I'm not going to tell you the trumpet player's name, but I said to him I said okay Al Hurt. So he thought for a minute and he said. Uh, Okay. <laughs> That's his answer. <laughs> That's a lie, man. But I love how hurt. But for him, it's like... <laughs> so anyway, it'll be a, a bit... It'll be a bit, a, bit of, a bit of trivia in there. Some people, you know, raise some eyebrows on some people. And some stuff that was said. It's, it's not... There's not... The thing about it, there's not one instance, maybe a half of one where somebody's kind of digging at somebody else. Otherwise, just, you know... Right. That's it. So anyway, I'm trying to get that republished, and I just don't know if I'm going to go with the same publisher as before um, or go with the right... I just want to go with the right people so we can make sure that it gets out. But it's, it's unprecedented what I've been able to assemble in one volume like that. Well, it's, um, and, it's uh, amazing that it's, you did that, and, and, that you, and I presume it's a continuation. Like, 10 years yeah, from now, you might well, have something else, right? Yeah. And more people. Still, so. still learning, man. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for doing this. It's it's a real thrill. Sure. Um, the album is called Basie Swings the Blues. It's coming out mm -hmm. September 15th. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds great. It's amazing. Yeah, and thank you. Um, mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking this time. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate it. Anytime. Great. Thanks. Thanks.